When we think about SHTF, we imagine it the way our storytellers said it would be. Gangs of armor-clad marauders competing for gasoline, deserted urban sprawl slowly reclaimed by nature, or near hopeless and lonely survival with only your closest family. But what if I told you that in the present day, it hit the fan numerous times all over the world, including the US, and that with the exception of those who live in the affected areas, nothing about those days for the majority of people in the world were any different than the previous day. A true worldwide reset on the magnitude portrayed in our popular culture requires an extinction level event. A majority of animals and plant life on the surface of the earth would be so affected to the point that one would have to wonder, would a world like this be survivable at all? Once all the new and high-tech prepper equipment inevitably breaks down, unless a community has the skills and ability to keep manufacturing replacement parts and refining a fuel source, survival in this type of world would mean a return to a more primitive time. After all, almost all modern people know what a car is. A few of us know how to fix them, fewer know how to make the parts, and even fewer still are able to acquire the raw materials needed to make one. As long as any major country in the modern world doesn't undergo the same catastrophic event, there will be orchestrated relief efforts in order to provide humanitarian relief, not only because of the goodwill of the donating country, but also from the hearts and minds perspective to win the populace over. Every human society wants to appear to be the good guy, either to its own people or to others, in order to facilitate its own larger goals. The destruction of our modern world requires so many failures on a global level that statistically it would be fantastical to consider, especially with so many people tasked with preventing such a complete collapse. So let's say the world as you know it ceased. What then? One only needs to look at the collapse of Argentina's system. Food prices skyrocketed by 2 to 300 percent and the price of other goods and services went up accordingly. The extremely wealthy were spared, but the middle class all of a sudden found themselves in a predicament. Lower income and poor people knew how to survive without much, and many were trained in services that they could provide. While the middle class, especially those in white collar jobs that had no practical purpose outside of modern society, like tax professionals or office workers, could only get by by selling their possessions for nearly nothing in exchange for a bit of money to buy food. For an in-depth look at this situation, we could take a look at the experiences of Fernando Aguirre, otherwise known as Furfall, who went through the collapse. There's no better person to talk about their experience than the man who lived through it. Humans crave safety and predictability. Order. Ever since the human population became large enough to band together for protection and food security, a leader or group of leaders would always emerge to guide the populace. The type of government doesn't matter. Historically, as long as people weren't randomly killed by wild animals, the elements, or starvation, people accepted whatever governing system was in place, whether it was to their detriment or not. If dissatisfaction arose, it would only be a matter of time before the dissent was either crushed or a new system would be put into place. This isn't even meant to be political. It's only historical. Of course, we all know Argentina exists today. It didn't devolve into the Thunderdome because life went on. For some, because of their own situation of either extreme poverty or incredible wealth, nothing really changed except for the disposition of their neighbors. However, lots of people in the middle class lost everything, while some made money through the chaos and uncertainty through unscrupulous means. A civil war would occur half a world away in Yugoslavia in the early 90s. This war was complicated not just by ethnic or national identity, but also because of religion and old grudges from other conflicts past. For the majority of the world, life continued as it had the day before. For many of us who grew up in the 90s, along with the first Gulf War, it was our introduction into televised conflict. 
The ethnic cleansing happening in Eastern Europe was something to watch on CNN, but not for the people living in the region. For them, shit hit the fan. The end of the world as they knew it was here. The breakdown of sanitation, healthcare, and security was nearly complete. With communities making do with what they had and relying on people who were skilled enough to make things work with the limited resources on hand. Seeking people who had the ability to provide security, the ability to either grow or find food, to purify water, to provide health services, or who could facilitate black market trade was the norm. Society will find a way to create order out of displacement until the dust settles. There's a first-hand account of this time period by Selko, who lived through the events of the Balkan conflict and genocide and provided insight into what's actually useful in unstable conflict zones. But shit hit the fan doesn't only happen in far-off lands away from the American homeland. It's already happened numerous times over the last 20 years. And most of you continued watching your favorite TV shows without skipping a day. One has to marvel at the layers of insulation the U.S. provides its citizens. Even under strained supply logistics, such as the one we saw in 2020, with stores running out of essentials and more recently the crisis in Texas and the fuel shortage on the East Coast, disruption tends to be regional and relatively short term. A total collapse of all order is seemingly impossible due to the redundant layers of bureaucracy. We have three notable American examples of this in the last 20 years that would give a peek into how each region in the U.S. would handle its problems. In 2005, Hurricane Katrina destroyed many lives in New Orleans, the hardest hit areas being poor and low income neighborhoods. The displacement of the population caused lots of homes, stores, and service centers to be abandoned. Looting was a problem, as opportunistic behavior increases in times of strife and uncertainty. The National Guard and other military members assisted in the evacuation process, a clear sign that despite the regional devastation, the central government was intact. Soon after, food, water, and shelter relief was established, and while it took years to build back to normal, life resumed as it always has. Hurricane Sandy ripped through the eastern seaboard, severely damaging New Jersey and New York, causing power outages and disruptions to every major service. Millions were left without power. However, communities came together. Makeshift electrical charging stations were set up in order to facilitate communication and minor recreation. Federal relief and supplies were sent into the area. Again, a sign that centralized government was still very much in power and attempting to resolve the situation. While the damage was dramatic, it was by no means permanent, and for many now, the event is just a bad memory. Around the same time, the power went out from the Mexican border to Los Angeles and east towards Arizona. The entire region had no electricity and millions of dollars worth of perishable food and medicine had to be discarded due to failing storage. Some neighborhoods had block parties and barbecues so that food wouldn't go to waste. For many medical facilities, backup generators saved the day. Teams worked around the clock to restore services, and after 11 hours, power was restored to the region. Redundant systems that enable our modern world to function the way that it does has saved us numerous times in the United States. Disruption has always been at a local or regional level, with the closest to a national emergency being the civil unrest of 2020. And despite that, you could still pop into Starbucks and order a drink, eat at McDonald's, or shop at Walmart. Your Amazon crap would arrive just in time with next day delivery. So realistically, what would it take to reach this? It would take so much devastation, you would have to question whether or not that life, based solely around survival, maybe even a solitary life until your body fails you painfully, completely, without the aid of modern medicine or other people to give you care and comfort is worth living at all. 
The more that we examine what's most likely to happen, it seems like the most realistic and immediate scenario would be a local or regional shit hitting the fan event. Most people around the country and the rest of the world will watch your plight from their phones while laying in bed. That isn't to say that your world hasn't ended or that your situation isn't dire. But most people around the world will continue to live, as they always have, on your worst day. But does this entitle anyone to be idle and wait for rescue? To live an unprepared life? Because what would be the point of being prepared anyway? No. Preparedness is also about increasing your comfort level, which reinforces your will to live, as well as doing the same for those around you. To forge community ties that can come together in times of crisis, so no one must subsist on primitive survival methods for extended periods of time alone, to be able to rebuild a more robust and resilient community than the previous one, after the danger has passed. A community that keeps itself secure, provides food for its people, and to provide medical and other emergency services. The point in imagining a scenario where shit hit the fan isn't only about acquiring gear, or gold, or guns. Although they do aid in the surviving and rebuilding process, the true essence of preparation is becoming a more valuable asset to your community through your skills and knowledge. Farming, medical care, engineering, construction, self-defense, craftsmanship. All of these skills provide value and compared to stockpiles of resources that must be replenished somehow, they weigh nothing and take no space. History has shown no man is an island. No matter how well stocked or full of grit they are, on a long enough time scale, eventually, the world simply moves on without them. If you've made it this far, thank you for listening. I hope I've made you consider a viewpoint you may not have thought about, and now you're working on improving that which can't be taken away from you. Being a valuable asset to your community uplifts all of us. If each neighbor strives to protect and work with those to his right and to his left, eventually, we cover everybody. I've put all the links to my reference stories on Argentina and the Balkans in my description. Please do take a look and give them a read. There's plenty of valuable information in them that may help you. If there's any situation you'd like to discuss, please let me know down below. And until the next video, be good, stay safe, and have a good one.